the curator of the exhibit and San Francisco's poet laureate and professor and incredible poet and author Alejandro Murguia. Let's give it up for Alejandro. Th thank you, Joan. And uh, thanks to the San Francisco Public Library and the friends of the San Francisco Public Library for their incredible support, uh, not just of this particular project, <clears throat> but of the Poet Laureateship and of poetry and literature and reading in general. So thank you very much for that. And I also want to thank you all also for taking time out from your busy lives to show up today and celebrate with us not just uh, the Virgen de Guadalupe, but also Tonatzin, the earth, uh, the mother of the gods uh, for whom Guadalupe stands in for and celebrate as well our indigenous culture with the danzantes and a little bit of indigenous Nahuatl poetry. And then of course to celebrate uh, something I'm very proud of and pleased to share with you today for the very first time, <coughs> the book based on the exhibit a uh, little piece of Mexico, and I have a little teaser for you uh, from the book a little bit later on. But uh, right now, uh, we want to start by having uh, the Danzantes de Ocali uh, do an offering for us to get the program started. So with that, let's bring on the group of the Danza de Ocali to the stage.
So uh, <clears throat> the danza is a prayer, actually. And so it's a prayer that was offering for uh, the four directions and for the four elements. And now they will do um, a dance for Huitzilopochtli, which is the, the main god, hummingbird on the left, the main god of the Mexicas. And then they will do, uh, follow that up with another danza for Malinali, who is sometimes uh, known as um, the translator, not sometimes, is known as a translator that uh, worked with uh, Cortez in uh, 1519 when they were entering the city of Mexico. So a dance for Huitzilopochtli, and then followed by another offering to Malinali. Muchas gracias, Tlazo Camati. Uh, antes que nada, siempre dándole gracias al Creador por darnos la oportunidad de estar aquí. Somos el grupo de danza Teocali, somos danzantes tradicionales de la Ciudad de México. Estamos aquí en representación a la fiesta que le hacemos todos los años a Tonancín, que en lengua náhuatl significa Venerable Madre o Nuestra Madre Tierra una dedicación a la Virgen de Guadalupe. Uh, so thank you all very much for coming here. We are Telcali, a traditional dance group from uh, Mexico City, and uh, we're here to honor and celebrate uh, Tonatzin, uh, whose name in Nahuatl means uh, Blessed Mother. Uh, queremos darle las gracias a todos nuestros antiguos, a las ofrendas de danza que hacemos En la lengua náhuatl, nuestra lengua paterna, le llamamos shitontequiza. Shitontequiza en la lengua náhuatl significa el movimiento cósmico. Es como nuestros antiguos nos enseñaron a rezar por medio del movimiento corporal y es como lo seguimos haciendo de generación a generación. Uh, so we want to offer thanks also to all our ancestors and who have followed us or who led us into this path. And the movement, the energy of the dance and the movement is how the prayer has been handed down to us, and it has a particular name in Nahuatl. Shitontequisa. Shitontequisa, which means Movimiento cósmico. cosmic movement or cosmic energy. Plazo Kamati.
Gracias, uh, Telcali Dan Santos. We'll bring them back again for another offering in a few minutes. I'm going <clears> to <throat> give a little brief background on the history and the residents of uh, La Virgen de Guadalupe, but I would like to start by invoking one of our great poetic pre-Columbian voices and poets, and uh, who was not only a poet, he was also a priest and a warrior and an architect and a philosopher. And I'm talking about uh, the great Nesawal Coyote, uh, Coyote Hambriente, uh, Hungry Coyote, uh, who <coughs> also questioned uh, the militarism of uh, the other communities around him and uh, sought to find a unifying force, a unifying God that was not uh, hungry or warrior-like. Um, and like so much of the pre-Columbian poetry, which by the way was called in Xochilincuicatl, in Spanish it would be flor y canto, and in English flower and song. So it's all metaphor, uh, the Nahuatl language, a very metaphoric language. And so a lot of the themes were, you know, the themes that have concerned poets throughout the ages around the world. Uh, why are we here? Who creates us? What purpose do we have? Uh, and then, of course, the great philosophical question, what happens afterwards, yes? So um, I want to read a fragment of a poem uh, by Nesabal Coyot. It is translated from the Nahuatl by um, Miguel Leon Portillo, one of the great scholars. And um, because my, na my broken Nahuatl is not much better than my broken English, um, I'll just read it in Spanish and translate it for you. Uh, so this is from the Sawal Coyote. And the Sawal Coyote states, by the way, are 1402 to 1472. So he lived entirely in the period before Columbus got lost. <coughs> Yo, the Sawal Coyote, me pregunto, ¿acaso de veras se vive con raíz en la tierra? No para siempre en la tierra, solo un poco aquí. Aunque sea de jade, se quiebra. Aunque sea oro, se rompe. Aunque sea plumaje de quetzal, se desgarra. No, no para siempre en la tierra, solo un poco aquí. I, Nesawal Coyote, ask myself, is it true that we really come to live on earth? Not always here on earth, only a little time here. Although it be jade, it breaks. Even gold breaks. Even the sacred plumes of the Quetzal fall apart. Not forever here on earth, only a little while here. <coughs> From Nesawal Coyote. And uh, let me kind of offer a few observations uh, on the importance and the resonance of the Virgen de Guadalupe. Uh, first of all, when exactly, I'm sure you all know the story uh, of the Indian Juan Diego who in December one day sees an apparition uh, that tells them she wants uh, a church built there. And after several tries, on the third time, she uh, gives him the proof, a hillside covered with roses, which he picks. And then in his tilma, similar to the dress that the Tansantas are wearing with that picture of Guadalupe, he goes to the bishop, Sumaraga, and when he releases the, the roses, uh, this image is, um, appears on, on his cloth, on his tilma. Now, uh, when exactly that happens, uh, a certain amount of, uh, as most histories, inconsistencies. Some say the traditional date of 1531, but others cite 1535 and other sources uh, 1580, right? What is not in doubt, though, is that in that same site uh, on the hill outside of Mexico City called the Tepeyac, where the church sanctuary to Guadalupe uh, was built, was the exact same site where for hundreds of years indigenous people had had a place of worship and of offerings. Not for Guadalupe, obviously, but for Tonantzin, uh, the Blessed Mother, the Mother of the Gods. And you can still kind of see a little bit of that resonance, in the indigenous resonance in uh, the image of Guadalupe. For, exa for example, 
You can see here that she has uh, like a cord tied around her waist, and cinta, meaning that it signifies that she's also with child, yes? Uh, mother of the gods. And <clears throat> another detail I'll just point out, see this, it looks like a shell, right? So another uh, indigenous concept, the shell in uh, pre Indian times was the placeholder that we use in Arabic for zero, yes? Because the Mayans and the indigenous people had the concept of zero, but their concept was different. The shell, which symbolized that placeholder, did not stand for zero the way in the Arabic s system, but for the opposite, for the possibility of everything, yeah? So that's the background of Guadalupe. And of course, uh, lots of debates, lots of inconsistencies. Uh, for example, uh, all the key historians of that period who were writing in the 1530s and in the 1550s and in the 1580s, none of them mention Guadalupe, yeah? And her story does not come into print till uh, the mid 1600s or so, 1620s, yeah? So there's a, a gap, a lacuna we call it, uh, a missing part there of what happens during that period. Uh, but like I said, what is, no doubt is that Guadalupe is in fact Tonantzin, uh, the indigenous goddess, <coughs> which is why she's brown and dark. But also, of course, in the hi throughout history, the image of Guadalupe has been so important, of course, uh, 1810, when uh, Mexico launched its independence, the priest Hidalgo used precisely the banner of Guadalupe to organize uh, people. Uh, later on, Emiliano Zapata, uh, the Virgen de Guadalupe was also the standard bearer uh, for his army <coughs> and his slogan, Tierra y Libertad. And even into the more modern era, uh, if, you remember, if you remember the huelgas and the fast of Cesar Chavez during that campaign for the farm workers, their standard was also Guadalupe. So she has this sort of m mystical, magical uh, aura about her. And I think it's true that whenever communities are under stress or under duress, um, figures like this, images, miracles happen. And even in our own time here in California, and California, of course, is part of Latin America, <coughs> and has nothing to do with the East Coast. And so you're all Latin Americans. <laughs> for, for example, uh, about 15 years, maybe a little bit more, right here uh, at Pinto Lake County Park by San Jose, uh, on an oak tree, La Virgen appeared, and for months and months, people would come to leave offerings, you know, gifts, uh, recuerdos, milagros, prayer. And uh, even more recently in Los Angeles, I believe, uh, downtown LA, the Virgen appeared on one of the, those big glass sky rises, right? And attracted a, a crowd. So definitely there's the power in the belief and in the energy uh, for so many centuries associated with the image of Tonatzin. And <coughs> let me just offer this observation about the Danzantes because we're gonna bring them back in a, in a little bit. So what they're doing is praying, yes? And in our ancient times, it would be the bravest warriors that would do the dance, that would do the prayers, yeah? So the question of the dance is very sacred uh, for us in that context. And um, I, I'm gonna bring him on right now. I just wanna tell you um, my own sort of brief story. When I was a young baby brown buffalo in Mexico City, one of my first memories, I must have been not quite four years old, is being in the procession of the Virgen de Guadalupe and uh, we were all carrying candles, and we were carrying these great, big, thick candles, and like I said, I couldn't have been more than four years old. It, it didn't turn out too well, because the candle kept getting heavier, and heavier, and heavier, and I caught the girl's hair on fire, who was in, fr <laughs> who was in front of me. <laughs> <coughs> That's my first memory about that. But, but even now, as an adult, perhaps I'm a little bit more agnostic about religion and things like that. But 
I still carry in my car an image of the Virgen de Guadalupe just in case. <laughs> so let, let's bring on Dan, Dan Santos uh, again, and then we'll present uh, a little bit of the book for you. Okay, let's bring the Dan Santos. Te Ocali, otra vez. <laughs> and uh, this will be their, their danza, Fortonatzin, yes? The indigenous uh, Virgen de Guadalupe. So let's bring them back on. Thank you very much. Uh, vamos a ofrecer es un canto popular, un canto que es dedicado a Tonantzin. We're going to offer a song, a prayer. It's a popular uh, prayer and song in honor in offering of Tonantzin. Uh, es un canto corto. Uh, les voy a decir algo breve de, de nada más de la letra. Eh, it's a brief song. I'll just tell you a little bit about what the words say. Eh, el significado de esta letra, uh, Wei Tonansim, uh, significa Gran Venerable Madre. So the phrase in Nahuatl, Wei Tonansim, signifies Great Venerated Mother. Eh, Tonansim, Venerable Madre. Eh, Ipan Nemowani, la que da la vida, la dadora de la vida. No, wani, the, the, she who gives us life. Moyo Lokatsin, tenemos tu agradable corazón. Moyo Lokatsin, we have your blessed heart. Atlaso Kamati, gracias. Atlaso Kamati, gracias. Thank you. Es en sí el significado de este pequeño canto que se lo veneramos a nuestra madre tierra y en este tiempo a nuestra madre, la Virgen de Guadalupe. And so these are uh, the lyrics of the song that we're going to offer now in honor of our Mother Earth and in also of the Virgen de Guadalupe. Y seguido vamos a seguir con un con una ofrenda de danza dedicada a la misma Madre Tierra Tonantzin. And we'll follow the song with a dance also dedicated to the Blessed Mother Tonantzin.
Gracias, Grupo del Santo del Cali. Let's hear for them one more time. And we'll, we'll bring them back in a few minutes when we close the ceremony so that they can give us uh, the closing um, prayer offering for us today. And again, I want to thank you all very much for coming by and all the folks at the library. And in particular, I hope, I'm not sure if all of you have seen the exhibit that's right across the hallway there, uh, A Little Piece of Mexico, which was organized by the staff of, uh, of the Jewett Gallery, and of course, Joan Jasper, and all those wonderful people. Let's give them a big hand of applause. <laughs> <coughs> and, and if you've seen the exhibit, it, it features over 200 pre-1910 Mexican postcards. Yes, so every postcard in the exhibit is over 100 years old. And the other thing that we are celebrating today is the, the reception for the book based on that exhibit. And so I want to give you a little bit of a teaser on it. Uh, here's the cover, yes. And uh, that postcard on the cover, by the way, is by Guillermo Calo. And the subtitle of the exhibit and the book is uh, The Postcards of Guillermo Calo and His Contemporaries. Now, unfortunately, I have to go around introducing Guillermo Calo as the father of Frida. <laughs> but in his own time, he was a very well-known uh, photographer, and in particular what our project of the exhibit has uh, revealed is that he was also the most prolific and innovative Mexican uh, postcard photographer of his time, yes? So the exhibit uh, shows the incredible range of his work, and, and, and uh, we'll see some of them in a second, right? Uh, Here's uh, the title page, and this, this image, by the way, is uh, of the Yucatan, uh, the Cortadores de Henneken. And so the exhibit and the book is um, separated by sections. It's organized uh, around sections. And you can see from the title page, uh, it has several essays just on Guillermo Calo and the work that he did on the postcards. Uh, an essay, this very interesting essay, by the way. Uh, during my research, I go to Coyoacan, if you know the town in Mexico City, to interview Arturo Garcia Bustos. And Arturo Garcia Bustos had been a student of Frida and had known Don Guillermo Calo, as he called them. So it, it kind of gives us a chance to see a really personal insight uh, into the man. Uh, and then uh, another essay on, a brief essay on uh, Mexican postcards up until about 1949. Because what happens in 1949, uh, which is as far as my own research goes, is that then the, the Kodachrome postcard starts taking over, and that's a mass-produced postcard, yes? And then eventually what happens is that all the scenes become the same, right? The girls on the beach at Mazatlan could be the same girls on the beach at Merida, right? There's no difference anymore, right? Whereas during this period, every image is very unique and very artistic. And uh, the exhibit, the, these uh, postcards that I'm showing you are all from the book and from the exhibit. But it, it begins with the very first uh, uh, Mexican postcards around 1882, uh, before uh, the images were allowed, uh, permitted. And this is one of the most fascinating postcards in the exhibit, right? Uh, you can barely see the date there, but it says December 19th, 1900. It is signed by Guillermo Calo, and it is not only one of the first postcards produced in Mexico, but it is a portrait of his which are super rare and unknown. And the only time you will see his portraits are in this exhibit where we feature uh, eight portraits done by Guillermo Calo because he's known mostly as an architectural photographer. And here's one of his masterpieces in the postcard genre. 
besides this being an incredible photograph, and you can see the detail of the shadows, and, he, and he's got just incredible detail on this. This is the main post office that was built in 1907, and this postcard is also embossed. So Gallo is one of the few who is the only one, actually, who is doing embossed postcards, right, which is much more... Uh, technical technique in that sense. I think this is a masterpiece of both embossing and of his photography. And we have uh, some of his contemporaries. This is the only woman photographer. Her name is Cecile Seller, and she does incredible ruins. We have several of them in the book and several in the exhibit. Uh, very interesting because she was the wife of one of the most well-known anthropologists, uh, Edward Seller, who first uh, translates uh, Cody's Borgia. Uh, so we were very fortunate to find some of her postcards. And this is a troje. So this is a granary, yes? And the only other place in the world that this type of grain granary exists is in the Republic of Georgia in the former Soviet Union. Now this is another one of the rare images. Uh, this is the big centennial parade of 1910. It's the last big hurrah of the dictator. and. Uh, this is the replication of Malinali, yes, uh, for whom we had the dance uh, earlier. And sh she's gotten a bad rep, right? Uh, often called La Malinche, to signify someone who has betrayed their country. But the interesting thing about the phrase is that if you look at the ancient text, it wasn't Malinali who was called Malinche. It was Cortez that's called Malinche. Yes, and what Malinche means, the captain of Malinali, and you hear that in Malinche, yes? So it's the first time perhaps in history that a man was named after a woman. And then of course, part of Mexico in 1910 was its push towards modernity, which is also some of the focus of the exhibit. Uh, and so part of Mexico was becoming very modern, railroads, ports, shipping, et cetera but other parts of Mexico were still living in the 1700s or 1800s and moving things by human labor. Uh, and then we have a whole section on uh, churches and ruins that are uh, really uh, beautiful. And an interesting note, the majority of the postcards, especially these colored lithograph ones, were uh, printed in Germany, which I think, they were the best printers of the time, which I think also gave Guillermo Calo an entrance, right? He was German, right? So he could communicate with these printers. Uh, this is uh, one of the themes that appears very much in the exhibit and in the book, that the Tejuanas, Right? This is kind of rare because this is an embossed image of the Tejuana, and you all know the story of the headdress, right? According to legend, myth, or chisme, <coughs> uh, a boat wrecked and, and all these petticoats were washed ashore there on the coast of Oaxaca. They didn't know what they were for, so they decided to kind of improvise them as a headdress. And then uh, we see here some of the photographs as uh, photography starts transferring over to uh, real photo postcards, yeah? So this is uh, the carnival in Culiacan, 1910. Wild outfits, huh? And then some images, right? Perhaps stereotypes or types, right, or cliches. Uh, And this is uh, the back cover, which uh, features another postcard by Guillermo Calo. This is by Abel Briquet. <coughs> and this is Vir Virginia Fabregas, the most important and famous actress uh, of that period. And uh, I just want to say, say, say that after our closing ceremony, which will come right now, uh, we will be uh, selling uh, the book and all the proceeds I have donated the entire print run. By the way, it's a very small print run, uh, so it's a collector's item already. Uh, I've donated the entire proceeds of, of all the books to the, San, to the friends of the San Francisco Public Library. So, <laughs> in, in kind of support for everything they've done for literature and reading and poets. So, uh, when you purchase the book, you're actually gonna be making a donation donation to the Friends of the Library, yes? And um, I know in most cases, if you buy a book from the author, 
they will sign it for you. Uh, in this case, I'll sign it twice. <laughs>
Let's, let's hear it for Grupo Danza Teocali. Uh, Tlaso Camati. Um, queremos nada más uh, informarles que uh, le quiero dar en especialmente las gracias a los jóvenes danzantes, que es la, para nosotros es importante transmitir nuestras raíces. Este, nosotros como padres tenemos la obligación ¿no? de inculcar nuestras raíces a nuestros hijos, no importa de dónde seamos, pero que nos sentamos orgullosos de dónde venimos, quiénes somos y hacia dónde vamos. Vamos a acabar, como empezamos con todo el respeto a este lugar, a, a la representación de nuestra madre Tonancín, la Virgen de Guadalupe, con el permiso a los cuatro vientos, a las cuatro direcciones, a los cuatro elementos de la tierra. Nuevamente, muchas gracias Alejandro por la invitación y a esta librería, Él es Dios. We, we want to thank in particular our, our young dancers who are following in the tradition of the elders. It's so important for the parents to uh, pass on the tradition and our roots. And we'll be closing then with our final uh, ceremony. We want to thank the library and our final uh, prayer dance to the four directions and the four elements. Muchas gracias. Thank you all very much. Okay, we want to thank you again uh, for this, and we continue to celebrate the birthday of our mother, Guadalupe Tonatzin, and to offer our prayers through our energy and our dance, and uh, the Coret Auditorium and the library has now been blessed many, many, many times by our prayers and our dance. Thank you very much.
you all very much, friends, for coming to honor us with your presence in our celebration of Guadalupe Tonantzin.